Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And I'm particularly psyched about today's guest. He is with a, a company that is one of the few that I hold in a high regard when it comes to making the tough decisions around people. And one of the toughest decisions is do I hire this person or do I keep looking? And, and I face that in my practice. I'm sure you face it in your business every day. You've got a candidate sitting in front of you. They seem to fit the part. They seem to map, match your culture, but you got to make a decision because no candidate's perfect. Is this the candidate I should go with or do I keep looking? And God knows how long it could be, right? It could be weeks or months. So Jason Fifdell is going to help us answer that question. And he's uniquely qualified to do that. He's the chief operating officer of a firm called GH Smart. Now, GH Smart has built an incredible business over the past decades around helping companies make these decisions, particularly growth stage companies. And I know many of you listeners are in that category. So he and his team worked with some of the top venture capital firms and private equity firms to help make the most important leadership decisions. Do I hire the CFO, CEO, COO, et cetera, et cetera. And they do it through a whole methodology that they've detailed in some best-selling books, which Jason will talk about. Now, Jason's the COO of the firm. He joined after a great career at Bain & Company before that J.P. Morgan MBA from Duke. It reads like, uh, like uh, I mean, what is it, Jason? You don't see many backgrounds like this. <laughs> On top of that, he's got a family with four kids based in Atlanta, and I'm so excited to have Jason. How are you, Jason? Great to be here, Jeff. Thanks for having me. I'm super pumped. And Likewise. I'll be honest, if, I, you know, if, I'm, if I'm candid, I wrestle with this question every day myself because there is no right answer. Yeah. Do, do I take this candidate or do I keep looking? It's much like you know, romance and love, right? Do I break up and keep looking and who knows I could be a bachelor the rest of my life? So yeah. especially in today's market when it's so tight on labor and no candidate is perfect. And if they are perfect, you can't afford them. So- I'd love to dig into this question for the next 20 minutes. Sound good? Yeah, let's do it. How do we start? Give us a 60-second framework of just kind of frame the question. What is the, the risk of a false negative or false positive? Why do I have to get this right? And then we'll dig into how, to, how, you know, how do I do my best to make the right decision? Yeah, so Jeff, you used the word never settle or the phrase never settle. And at GH Smart, I use the, the term never compromise uh, when right. it comes love to it. people. Love so it. when you're making a decision to hire somebody, or I would extend that to say whether you're making the decision to promote somebody into a very important position, and you've got to make that right call on talent, yep. there's nothing more important you can do as a leader than make the right call on talent. Putting the right person in a role, they'll give you 5, 10, 15, 20 times plus the productivity yep. of the wrong hire. Yep. So your, your quickest road to success and to having your weekends back is getting the right people and team around you. Not just hiring them, but to your point, Jason, advancing them, promoting them at the right time, right. into the right That's role. Right. It doesn't, yeah. you know, I probably beat the drum a little too much on just recruiting. That's where the, that's where the hard work begins because yeah. then you have to advance them and retain them, et cetera. That's right. And what's, uh, what's, what's fascinating about this is if you're great at the skill at hiring, fundamentally you're great at assessing talent. And as a leader, there's a lot of decisions you need to make around promotions or what we call role crafting to say, I'm going to move Sally yeah. from being in finance to sales. Right. If she wants to grow, you know, in her career and try different things, can she do that? And so if you get great at this notion of hiring, that means definitionally you're great at evaluating talent, which then as a leader opens up your aperture of how you manage your team. And is that a skill that anyone can learn? Are you convinced after years of doing this, or would you say, there are just some, some executives and some leaders that don't have that talent assessment DNA in them, and they should delegate it. Yeah, so here's what's, here's what's fascinating. We may uh, get into the topic of coachability in our time together yep. this morning. But as we, if you were to lay out a series of competencies in terms of, on one end of the spectrum, things that are very easy to change, uh, so what you're wearing, if that was a competency, yep. you could change that. Things that are very hard to change, your cognitive ability. Yep. Uh, if you were to put hiring on that spectrum, it would actually be on one of the most easy things, the easiest things you can learn as a manager, provided you actually have the motivation. You have to have the will to want to hire a good team at the set aside time to truly prioritize it. But if you have that, 
the skills of assessing someone to know whether or not to hire them are one of the most trainable things that, that is actually out there. And I'm guessing that's because most people rely on gut, which is very squishy. If you yes. use a system, a process, it doesn't even matter what process it is. It could be that's right. from your amazing book, Who. It could be from my book, Recruit Rockstars. It could be from any, any process you make up. If you follow yeah. the process and a discipline, you're going to avoid a lot of hiring mistakes. Yeah, that's right. And the process can be boiled down to two things. One is know what you're looking for. Yeah. And then two, have a structured, systematic way you go out finding out if the person's capable of doing that thing. And I would add a third, yeah. don't compromise. Never compromise on yeah. someone, right? Okay, that's right, so, yeah. So now let's, let's, so now we understand kind of the, the, the framework. Let's drill yeah. into the specific example I have in mind, which is we've developed a scorecard. We yes. know what we're looking for. That, you know, mm. We'll cover that on, on another episode. So we kind of know what we're yeah. looking for, both in terms of culture fit, DNA match, the soft yes. stuff, so to speak, yeah. and then the competencies and skills. Okay? Yeah. By the way, if you don't develop a scorecard, stop, st stop listening now because you've got far bigger <laughs> problems. Okay, so now yeah. we know what we're looking for. Yes. We interview a candidate. We find them. They're amazing. She's out of central casting. You know, she has just an amazing culture fit and DNA match, but she's missing a competency. She's missing some experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe she hasn't built financial models. Maybe she hasn't raised venture capital money. Maybe she hasn't launched a new product. Whatever it is, she just hasn't done it. But yeah. she's great on all other dimensions. And so now we have the decision to make, which is do I proceed Mm -hmm. with the full confidence that she can pick it up on and learn as, as she goes fast. Yeah. The speed is everything now. Or do I say it's non-negotiable, it's going to take too long, or it's too big a risk, and therefore I should keep looking. And by the way, if I do, it could be six months before I find the next great candidate. So yes. that's, the, that's the very difficult everyday decision. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Because that's, no, that's, there's no candidate's perfect. Yeah. No candidate's perfect. And within it, you're – as a leader, you're probably, if you're final, your final interviews, a quarter of candidates, let's say, you know are going to be great. You match them up against that scorecard. Yeah, there's a few gaps, yeah. but you know by and large, you feel really good about it, and all the other interviewers do too. Yep. Uh, and then there's a good, a good chunk, maybe a third, that are just, you got into that final step, and you're like, no, no way. Those are the got easy ones. 50%, right, right. That, uh, that they have some big gap, and this is where you're asking yourself, do I settle? Am I settling by taking this person or am I making a smart decision because they have the potential to close the gap on those one or two areas yeah. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've found. And at GH Smart, you know, we've assessed over 18,000 mm. leaders. Uh, we, we've assessed we have the biggest database on a, you know, assessing for and evaluating you know, executives and people that manage teams in the entire world. Incredible. We, what we found is there's some things you can look at to try to inform that decision rather than having to just take a leap of faith on that given dimension. So before you go through what those are, you're going to reveal this in a second. I'm, I gotta, yes. I got to get a pen. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I just thought of the episode for the, this, uh, the title for, the, for this episode. It's going to be Mind yeah. the Gap. Mind the Gap. Mind right? the Gap. Mind the Gap. Yes. Okay, Great. So we, got, so we got two candidates. Jack and Jill, she's missing one thing. He's missing another. We're going to pick yes. one. We got to get the search done. Yes. We got, we got a business to run. And we need to think about which is the lower risk path, which is more likely that she'll learn this or he'll learn that. Yes. So what are the key, before you take us through how to look at them, what are the key things? You mentioned one earlier, coachability. Can you elaborate on that? Because everyone yeah. thinks they're coachable. <laughs> uh, well, and let me, yeah, let me reframe it. I'll break it down to this is really, you're looking for two things ultimately is the, uh, a, 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 an agility and potential to make change, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of a form of coachability. Yep. And then secondly, you're looking at, I'll use a fancy word here for your, your listeners, malleability oh, of what needs to change. Yeah. See if that sticks in, in folks ears here. Yeah. So is, is what you actually, what they need to actually come up to speed on or change or get better at, is it naturally something that's easier or harder to learn and get better on? Yep. Because if you've got, if you've got somebody that is, has the best, most potential in the world has the most agility, all these innate things that allow them to, to come up to speed quick, quickly on things and overcome things, but you're asking them to change something that's really hard, right. uh, uh, like an underlying motivation, then, then you're, you're pushing up, you know, a, a rock up a hill. Got it. So malleability. Yes. And and co the ability to make change, ability yeah. to drive change. Yeah, yeah. You can call that agility and potential, right? Agility and potential. So yeah. 
in a case where I'm looking at a candidate and I can't assess experience because she hasn't done this thing, I have yeah. to assess her potential to do this thing and yes. learn it damn fast. Yeah, that's right. So, all right, so potential, let me share how we think about Yeah, potential. that was my next question, yep. Yeah, uh, and there's two things you can look at. One is, have they demonstrated agility and growth in their background? And for your listeners, this is the, this is the exciting thing because this is something without even knowing about some of the fancier psychological markers I'm going to talk about in a second, you can, as imminently doable in an interview, uh, to find out from someone if you're walking through their career history in a structured manner. So demonstrated agility is one piece. And then the other one is psychological markers, which I'll get into in a second, which deal before with you go to Before you go to markers, let's just use yeah. an example. This is a, a, a woman we're thinking about hiring for our CEO yeah. position. She's got a gap. Maybe she hasn't raised VC money. Yeah. But, and she has demonstrated over and over and over again that she knows how to learn new shit and yes. put it to work quickly. And she's a student and digs in and she's curious. What yep. you're saying, I think, Jason, is that pattern tends to repeat and that pattern doesn't just stop. It's just that that, that is almost part of DNA because it's hardwired, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but what you're, you know, what you're measuring is not actually the, D, the DNA components that give someone potential. You're actually just looking at have they done it in the past. So if you're yeah. interviewing this woman, uh, you're going to look at, say she's talking about a chapter in her career. One of the questions you, sh you could be asking is, you know, when you moved into that role, how long did it take you to come up to speed? You know, what, did you come up to speed faster uh, than your peers? Yeah. Uh, did you come up to speed faster than your boss or the board expected you to do? And what you want to see is somebody who, who comes up to speed fast. And then right. secondly, you want to see somebody who's been put in a variety of, of, of contexts. So somebody who's worked, let's say, within a large corporation uh, in sales roles and has quickly gotten promoted up to more senior and senior sales roles, but hasn't rotated to other functions or yeah. been to other companies, uh, they, they actually just haven't demonstrated the ability to, to, to make the change. So you're taking more of a risk. They might still be able to do it, but they haven't shown it. So you want to look in those interviews for different contexts. And within those contexts, uh, in this case of this woman, has she come up to speed uh, quickly and been a high performer? As I've led businesses and, and been a recruiter, I found there are these people. And you can just throw yeah. anything at them. And, and they somehow, they get it done. They figure yeah. it out. And it's something they've never done before. In fact, they, they love the concept. They are like yeah. lifelong learners. And they love being thrown into a mess that they have no idea what it is. And they figure it out. It's like a puzzle. That's right. Is this, I know everything is a learned trait, Jason, but is this learnable or for the most part, are people either wired this way or they're not wired this way? A lot of it is, a lot of it's wiring, but you can't underestimate. This is why I keep coming back to this demonstrated agility and growth. Yeah. Somebody, you know, it's like you take a seed, right? And seeds have different potential to grow. If you've placed the seed in a fertile ground, you'll get a lot more out of it. Yeah. Uh, and then you may transplant that plant to another pot. Right. And if it was sort of had a chance to move around different environments, it actually has grown to be through those experiences plus their DNA, a more agile and potential thing than taking a seed and just planting it, you know, in a brand new place, if that makes sense. Yep. So there is, there is very much a shaping element of even the DNA you're born with that it, over time reps in different contexts matter. So as you're looking for somebody, you're looking for hard, hardwired signals, but you're looking for the, the chance for them to practice those muscles across varied environments, right? Got it. How do you, after you go through that structured interview, and yes. You're assessing their history of evolving, changing, growing, handling new stuff. How do you ultimately make the assessment of the degree of risk, right? Because there's always some risk that she won't be able to learn this new skill or he won't be able to learn that one. Yeah. How do, how do you know if you should plow ahead or say, this is just too big a risk? How do you, do you assess it with a number score, ABC? Do I check references to get my answer? Like how ultimately do I make the decision? Yeah. So I, I would like to say we have a, an algorithm that can solve that for you, but we don't. It does come down to judgment. Yep. But uh, in GH Smart, as we assess these leaders, we are systematic about it. So you will actually look at things like in the past, if you take one candidate that is in five different places, five out of five times consistently performed versus the next one, four out of five times, the five out of five times person that has shown that agility is going to be a less risky than the four out of five. Right. 
So you need to actually go back and look at your interview data, reflect on it, your notes to actually see how consistent has that pattern been. And then you can make a probability probability weighted assessment. And we haven't talked about malleability, in, uh, which we will in a second, of yep. what actually needs to change, which is a, a key part of it. So we'll get to malleability. Yeah. What, but, but what I, hear, I think I hear you saying is, all else being equal, which it never yeah. is, two candidates, one has demonstrated this change coachability, learn new skills trait, time and time again for the past five years. Yes. Another one has demonstrated that for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Is the latter the less risky candidate? Because I can have a, it's like a, a stock that's gone up and up and up, more likely <laughs> to go up than down? Yeah, that's, yes, that's like, it's likely the case, but you know, uh, at GH Smart, we don't like to weigh, we don't like to think of things in terms of years, right? Okay. So somebody with 10 versus 20 years, the 20 right. years is always better. Right. Uh, so you're really looking at the magnitude of, of what they're doing. So somebody doing it repeatedly over 20 years may be not as strong, you know, may not show as much agility and potential as somebody who, who's done it a few times over five years, but boy, those times they did it, they like jump yeah. from one industry to the next. They went from running a team of 10 to a team of yeah. thousands. So like the severity uh, yeah. or the dramatic nature of it, the complexity. Yeah, the magnitude. Yeah, we call it the magnitude. It. Magnitude, okay. So the consistency and the magnitude and the variability of what they're dealing with, all that together gives you a sense for how agile the person right. is. So the person who does a bunch of interviews has a glass of wine and then relies on their gut and said, yeah, I just like her better you are potentially making an enormous mistake because you're not taking the time to reflect. Correct. Hopefully you ask the right questions. If you didn't, you're screwed anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and reflect on the data. You happen to have a magic database of 18,000, but this is pattern recognition, right? Someone it who is. recruits over time can get better and better at it. Yep, pattern okay. recognition. And there's something to taking notes in interviews. Uh, right. Smart, we type the notes. Not yeah. everyone has that luxury. Yeah. But, uh, taking notes is, is, in, is important if you can do that in a way that, uh, you know, still allows you to have rapport with the candidate. You, ha you uh, have you actually, to. I don't know. Unless you have a photographic memory, I don't know how you do you know, yeah. you're not taking notes. That's right. Just people, I see people, I, I watch my clients interview and they just scrawl in the margins of the resume and it's just yeah. like a waste of time. Okay, uh, let's talk. So, uh, on that point, this is a tactical point, but it's actually a, a meaningful. So yeah. in terms of you're getting data, right? Uh, yeah. And you're reviewing the data to assess somebody. So the, the most distracting thing for a candidate isn't actually if you had literally a, a stenographer typing the, all the notes in front of the candidate. It's somebody sporadically taking notes. So if you are the person with a sheet of paper and every three minutes you, you glance down and write something, what you're signaling to the candidate is, is whatever they just said is really important and you're passing judgment on it. Yeah. And then so the candidate tries to say, oh, what did I, what, I must have hit a hot button. What I, yeah. Yeah. You know, hot button or boy, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. So what you want to be doing is you want to be consistently taking notes because you consistently need all the data and you don't want to, you don't want to do anything that's going to distract the candidate or lead the candidate to knowing what you're looking for, right? Yeah, I totally agree. Let's move to malleability yeah. before we yeah. wrap up. Tell us about malleability. Yeah, so malleability is this concept of the actual thing that needs to change, how changeable is it? So, uh, for instance, if, if, uh, if you're looking on things of the spectrum, let me give you a spectrum on things that are easier to change. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hiring A players, like that skill of hiring is easy to change. Uh, managing execution right through a discipline regimen is actually teachable. You can teach somebody, there's sure. books out there written on how you run effective meetings, operating cadences, yep. Yep. dashboards. Uh, interesting delegation follows. Uh, it's not easy. It's harder than those, but there's plenty been written around how you can actually teach somebody to effectively delegate their yep. skills and things you can learn to do that. So as you think about those sorts of things, those are easier to change, more malleable. Uh, things on the other end of the spectrum is somebody's cognitive ability, their innate risk-taking, willing to take on challenge and, and risk, uh, their work ethic, yep. uh, and some key motivational aspects. So if you see somebody who's highly relationally driven yeah. versus somebody who is driven by, say, achievement, Sure. If, you're, if you're putting them in a role that's really all about achievement, not relationships, they're not going to all of a sudden become a very no. achievement-oriented person. So you, I, I found, and disagree if, if you like, I have found these are pretty hardwired characteristics you're describing. 
yeah. that are formed from the reading I've done by age eight, according yeah. to psychologists, barring yeah. any life-changing trauma. Yeah. You know, work ethic, very much a function potentially of your upbringing and, and mm -hmm. those kind of things and how you handled school, how you thought about schoolwork, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, risk taking, right? It's not yeah. like you get to age 35 and you say, oh, I'm going to be a risk taker now, right? Unless yeah. you won the lottery, in which case, yes, it was a life-changing event. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you agree that these tend not to change that much over time? So, it, it, again, depends on what – we're talking about specific gaps. So, let's take the – let's call her Sally, the CEO you were looking at before. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, it depends what the gap is that you see. So let's say Sally to be CEO, one of the important things she's going to need to do is come in and set the strategy for the firm uh, or for the company. Yeah. And you're saying, oh, I think she may have a gap in her strategic thinking ability uh, and her analytical ability. And, yeah. and, and so if, if you, what you need her to do is actually do that analysis herself and draw on that strategic thinking and cognitive ability, you know, that's not really going to change. But yeah. what if you need Sally to do is just uh, be decisive about the strategy and maybe she's right. really decisive and she's going to hire a consultant to set the strategy for it, and you're willing to pay for that. And it works fine. Maybe it can be the fit, right? So you need to think about the context. That's of right. Funding uh, the team around the person that the urgency, how much time we have to make these yeah. decisions and, yeah. and then, and then make the decision in that context. That's right. That's right. Yep. Got it. Got it. Boy, there's a lot to it. I mean, you make it sound super simple and that there's a framework for it, but uh, it is nerve wracking when you have yeah. to make that decision. And P.S. sometimes go to your boss or go to the board and say, I'm putting my name on this candidate and yeah. you better be right. It could be a bet your That's own right. job decision, right? If you get it wrong. That's right. Yep. It's the most important decision you can make in business. Uh, I've used this phrase before. You are who you hire. Kind of like uh, your mom used to say, you are who you eat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ultimately, your company is shaped by who you hire. So you need to spend the time on these things, need to take them incredibly seriously and, and treat them with the same level of rigor and analysis that you would other important financial or market yeah. decisions you're making in your business. Your firm, GH Smart, has w written some wonderful best-selling books. If there was one that you think best addresses or touches on this topic, which would it be? Well, on the topic of hiring, it's our book, Who? The A Method for Hiring, where we walk through uh, and share our secrets from 20 years of assessing leaders yep. on how to make great hires and increase your hiring success rate from 50% to 90% plus by yep. following a few simple steps. I've read this book, uh, I don't know, 20 times. Uh, <laughs> I've met, I've met your, uh, your founder and I try to live by this and every day I make mistakes. It's, it's simple but not easy. That's uh, right. But if you at least have a framework, you got a fighting chance. If you're doing Absolutely. it by gut, you're going to be relegated to 50% accuracy, which you might as well skip the whole thing, flip a coin, and be done. That's right. Yep. You save yourself a lot of time, uh, but then you lose a lot of money and sleep and et cetera. So why not go for it and do it the right way? Well, I give you a lot of credit. Really appreciate you taking the time. How can people learn more about GH Smart or the book Who or get in touch with you, Jason? Yeah. So the book's available anywhere you buy books, right? Uh, if, uh, if they want to learn more about GH Smart, they just go to ghsmart.com and can read up about us on the website or reach out to me. My email's available on the team page on our website. Fantastic. Thank you so much for making the time. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Never, never compromise. That's right, never settle. Never settle. <laughs> Take care.